Thank you. We'll, we'll start the meeting and welcome. Um, my name is Di Robinson and I'm with the SES Community Engagement Unit and I'll be facilitating the meeting tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the First Peoples of the Murray River and Mallee region as the traditional owners of the land and waters on which we meet tonight and pay our respe my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. And we also honour the servicemen and women who have sacrificed their lives in the defence of our freedom, peace and prosperity, and also the, so the pioneers who have guided and forged our communities. Um, welcome and thank you for coming out. Tonight's meeting will be a little bit different. We're going to go crazy and just go a little bit off track. Um, we haven't got as many people who have come tonight and we're going to take that as a positive and we're hoping that people are feeling that they do have information. But because it is a smaller group, um, but we also do have live streaming, we thought we might go through our speakers uh, as we have before. Um, but then we will open the, I'll open the floor up for questions and a bit more of a conversation type format and I hope that suits you. Um, but we'll still go ahead and I would like to, um, it'll be wonderful to have all our great speakers provide you with an update of what they've been um, doing and where things are at. Just as some little bit of background too for the SES, um, we are the South Australian State Emergency Service and it is a volunteer based emergency assistance and rescue service who provide emergency service 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year and we respond to a, a variety of calls for assistance each year um, and there are emergencies that are a result of extreme weather events like flooding and storm and also heat wave. At the moment we have about 1,600 volunteers across 73 units in South Australia. And that's probably the re that is the reason that I'm facilitating the meeting tonight from the SES because we are the lead agency for um, flood. So that's why we're here. Tonight's meeting again, it's an information session, and you know it'll be great to have a, a little bit more of an informal feel about it. We will hear from the speakers first, so please hold your questions or queries until the end. So let's start it off, and I would like to um, invite Brad Frew who is the incident commander from the SES, uh, the incident controller, um, to give us an update where we are with the SES. Thanks, Brad. Excellent. Thanks, Di. Um, and as Di introduced, I'm Brad Flew, uh, the current incident controller from the South Australian State Emergency Service. Um, first off, just want to make a big welcome to everyone online and here tonight. Just, um, it's great to see you all and a good opportunity for us to be able to give you some information about our activities that we're undertaking um, and some of the things that we are you know, monitoring with this river and flood emergency that's occurring at this moment. So I'll give you a quick rundown of the current situation and the activities uh, that are occurring then I'll quickly run through some of the things you can do to prepare um, and some of the things that we need to be aware of when working and, and living in this, in this beautiful area. So as we know, what we've been seeing coming across the border is about over 150 gigalitres of water a day um, crossing the border and flowing into South Australia. And I'll allow DEW to talk in a minute and a bit more about in detail about those flows and what, and what that looks like. So these flows, while we talk about them being, you know, the largest flows we've seen, seen since 1970s um, and being similar to those levels, that's really just a guide. So it gives us a bit of an indication that that's the sort of impacts we may see. Um, however, it's only a guide. We may see things that are different, the river is different, um, and, the, and the, uh, the way it behaves will be different. And again, I'm sure um, Chrissy in a minute will talk about that in more detail. So what SES is doing at the moment is we're working with a whole number, a number of other agencies and, and all of our um, partner councils and things like that to be able to understand what the impacts are and have, prepare a response for this emergency that's occurring at the moment. As you can see today, we've got a whole number of agencies with us um, and here to give you some great information and help keep you informed about some of the things we need to consider. Um, locally here at Loxton, um, we have our incident management team based on Armstrong Street. So that's probably why locally you've seen a whole number of SES vehicles and other emergency services vehicles in town and uh, you know, staying at a lot of the accommodation around here as well. So that's where a lot of our presence is, is here. 
With the incident management team, we also have a uh, what's called a zone support team, um, and that's another forum where um, we work with all of the uh, local councils involved and all of the government agencies involved to make sure the information and collaboration is occurring between all agencies and to organise things like this so that we can ensure uh, we're updating you guys um, about everything that's happening uh, in regards to this. In terms of local impacts, um, there's a number of things uh, that are obviously impacting this community. Uh, one of them being Bookpanong Road probably being one of the biggest things that we've seen um, people talking about and, and being concerned about. We understand that that's been a, a big impact um, on some of our day-to-day -day lives here um, and on some of your transport routes and, and factors for people to be able to transport to their normal locations, whether it's workplaces and back and forth, and some of the services that you need to be able to um, access, that you normally would access through a place like Berry. Um, so, rest assured, we've worked with as, as all the agencies that we can to make sure there's strategies in place with that um, and to, to work to make sure that you guys have everything that you need um, available to you to be able to support. Unfortunately, the reality is that some of the transport routes are going to take longer to get some of the places that we need to. But it's not just about Book Phenom Road, there's a whole number of other roads that have been closed. There's access routes that people are normally used to um, being able to access and may use to access their properties. So, that, that's certainly been a, um, a large number of road closures in the area. Um, and not too far from you, obviously, is the Lyric Ferry being closed as well. So that all, um, unfortunately, does add up. Um, across the broader area of the river, um, we know levees, and, and this area has um, a few levees as well. There's been a lot of work done with local government and private levee owners and others um, to ensure that the levee systems are prepared and provide that protection as well. Um, so th that work has been ongoing throughout this event. Um, the other thing that's occurring um, in the local area as well, you may have seen an extra, uh, an extra, apologies, you may have seen a helicopter operating in the area. Um, SES has a helicopter based out of the Loxton um, Aerodrome at the moment, um, and that's undertaking some reconnaissance activity. So that's where we've seen that extra, um, you know, potentially a little bit of noise around on the outsides of town as that helicopter's moving around. So if people are wondering what that is, that's our aerial platform for reconnaissance and photos and providing intel back in the IMT to help ensure you got, ensure that we have the information we need to, to make decisions as required. Uh, we've also had a significant amount of other work being undertaken with door knocking across um, the length of the river. So uh, we've been door knocking the community to ensure um, people are informed and have that opportunity for information exchange between ourselves and um, the people that are likely to be impacted. This has been heavily supported by um, SA Police and other, other agencies such as PERSA, um, giving us a hand to, to get that messaging out there. We've also seen a large contingent of boats out on the water to knock, knock on those isolated properties as well to, to, say, to see how they're travelling and if anyone is staying in those locations. So that's seen a large number of our vessels and other government vessels and support agency vessels moving up and down the river. Uh, in terms of public information, um, a lot of, all of our information available tonight that we're going to talk about tonight and a lot of people may talk about phone numbers and different websites you can visit to um, access information is available on the sa.gov.au website. So that's sa.gov.au. And that website's been set up as a single source of truth where you can go to to get any of the information from all the agencies involved. So on that website, you can access um, some flood modelling, you can access um, imagery to show you, um, if you're likely to be impacted um, by flood. But again, those maps and tools are a guide only, so they give you an opportunity to, to see what the, if you're likely to be impacted, and then they help you inform yourself about the decisions you need to make about what to do um, in the event that you are going to be inundated. Along with that, we have a hotline set up, so not everybody is available um, or likes to be able to access on computer to access those websites, so you can use other services such as um, your local council facilities, and we also have an info line head up, information line set up as well, which is 1800 362 361, and that's the River Murray hotline, so anybody can ring that, and they're a place that you can use um, to gather any information you need for this um, incident. Uh, you would have seen some of our warnings. Um, we have a number of uh, watch and act messages along the river, which is just public information about what your risks are and where that risk is for the, for the Murray. So those, those uh, alerts and warnings continue to be updated with any pertinent information uh, that you need to be aware of, um, and you can find them on our website as well. So just some of the key messages um, about things that um, you need to consider if somebody, if you're at risk or your family or friends are at risk um, of inundation is 
consider your personal circumstances. So if you're make, starting to make a decision about are you going to stay or are you going to go, are you going to prepare your property and try and stay in your property, or are you going to make the decision to leave early? There's some really important things if you do decide that you want to stay that you need to consider and think about. And they're really about your personal circumstances. So your medical, social, uh, financial, um, your ability to, to manage extended periods of time in isolation, the emotional impact and your mental health um, considerations. Um, and the reality is if your property is likely to become isolated, you're going to lose all your utilities. You won't have power, sewerage, um, and potentially communications may be difficult as well. So they're all considerations you need to take into consideration before you make your decision. If you do cho choose to stay, you need to make sure that you're prepared to do that. It is potentially could be long weeks, many, many, many weeks, depending on your situation. So we strongly encourage you to leave early. Leaving early is going to be the safest option um, and the best option for you. Um, leaving early means that you can, under, you can undertake property preparedness and make sure your belongings and things are as safe as they possibly can be and then make the decision to leave. With leaving, uh, that, can put a number of, that can put a bit of pressure on yourself in terms of having somewhere to go. So by the best thing or well, the first place to, to turn to is family and friends. If you can stay at family and friends and find another loca location to stay, that's by far going to be the best result for you and the most, the most um, comfortable result. Um, in the event, though, that you don't have somebody, somewhere to stay and you uh, find yourself in a position where you're displaced, we do have relief centres set up across um, the area. So there's currently one set up in Barrie, which we, you can pop down and visit. Um, or you can actually call their hotline, which you can find their phone number on that sa.gov.au website. Um, some key safety messages um, for yourself and your families and your households. Um, obviously with the river, the river is um, very, absolutely beautiful at the moment. Um, it, you know, it, it looks fantastic and can be very inviting as well in terms of our recreational activities for people to want to recreate in there, play, swim and, and all those sorts of things. But we really need to be mindful of some of the risks that are with floodwaters and we ask people not to swim or play in floodwaters. Floodwaters can be com incredibly dangerous for us to play in um, and recreate in. Um, it doesn't take much in height of water, uh, only a couple of inches of, of moving water to be able to knock somebody off their feet. Um, and we really want to strongly encourage that message out in the community that it's not safe for people to be playing in those floodwaters. The other thing is don't drive through floodwaters. We have a lot of road closures in place for a number of reasons um, out in the community. So roads are closed for a reason. Um, more often than not, they're inundated or they're closed to protect the infrastructure of the road um, in preparation for inundation. So if we can just ask to actually abide by those uh, road closures and trying to drive through flood water um, that you can't see underneath and you can't see what damage has been done. So again, that's a safety thing. Um, the roads could be damaged, eroded, and then you could be causing damage to the roads as well. So we really just ask you to um, please abide by the road closures, as frustrating as they may be at some times. Um, in terms of act activity on the water, um, we ask you to be mindful um, of your capability and your um, ability on the water. So we understand a lot of people have been uh, operating on this river for many, many, many years um, and it may be tempting to, to go beyond your skill level, but the river is moving, there is a significant amount of flow. So if you're not comfortable in operating in those conditions, we ask that you don't um, and really take that into consideration before you make a decision to go out in your boat and um, undertake activities. So in closing, without um, going on for too much while we um, spend a bit more time tonight, um, have taken an opportunity for questions. Um, I just want to reassure everyone that we are working hard um, to make sure we communicate all the information we possibly can and make sure that public information for you to be able to make decisions and find out the information you want is as available to, to you as it can be. Um, we are running an interview um, or a radio update on ABC Radio on 7.20 on Monday morning, so to give the community a bit of an update about the activities that were happening. Um, so feel free to tune into that for weekly information as well. We have another, a number of other products being released as well, as weekly newsletters and things like that, as well as our standard available um, brochures and pamphlets and a number of other things, which are at the back of the room uh, for anyone if you want to have a look and, and see if there's anything of relevance there for you. Some of the key ones are our sandbagging information and how to prepare for a flood. So there's some great information there about how to prepare your property um, and also um, how to prepare yourself for a flood and, and emergency checklists and things like that as well. Um, also just want to reassure everyone that we're identifying risks and working with the different agencies. We work daily 
um, with everyone involved with this flood um, to understand any risks and make sure we're addressing everything we possibly can. And at any stage, um, our response phone number for flood and storm response is 132500. Um, and in the event of an emergency, um, dialing triple zero. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. That was fantastic. Um, as Brad said, the brochures are up the back, um, and I'd invite you to take some for yourself and any um, friends or relatives that you have that um, haven't been able to make it tonight that you think may be useful for. And also, just reaffirming that sa.gov.au website, there is a brochure up the back that lists all the agencies there. So all the links to the different agencies are on that one website, which is just fabulous. Um, all right, next up, I'd like to invite Chrissy Bloss from the Department of Environment and Water. Hi there. Uh, my name's Chrissy Bloss. I'm the manager of water delivery. Uh, for the River Murray in the Department for Environment and Water. My normal day job is uh, working with upstream departments and SA Water and our environmental water managers to manage the flow and water level um, and water quality in the River Murray um, and also the lower lakes and barrages. And this type of flood just makes it heck of a lot more interesting. Um, I've also been involved in River Murray for a long time. Um, the flood, I'm quite familiar with the flood mapping products, worked on those uh, a few years back in the department. So. Um, if you want to throw any curly questions about the flood mapping that we've got online, I'm, I'm the girl for that. Um, tonight I want to run through the flow forecast um, and also some of the information that we have available uh, for you to help understand your risk better. And then I also want to talk about um, some of the things that we're seeing as this uh, event comes, uh, starts to get into the, uh, the uh, closer towards some peaks. And then I'll uh, finish up just with a quick word about Blackwater. So the good news is, is that we haven't uh, had any change in advice from um, the, the agencies we talked to upstream. We talked to the Murray Darling Basin, Basin Authority, the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, Water New South Wales, um, the, the Victorian uh, Department for Water, it's got a longer name. And it has been a, it's been consistent now for the last few weeks. Um, we are expecting a, a bit of a peak, I'm going to call it a little bit of a, a, little bit of a lump, um, to get to the border uh, probably in the next couple of days. Um, it looks like it's flattening out. Um, and then uh, a few weeks after that, in late December, there'll be probably a larger flow uh, coming. Now, we've got some... Uh, that one at the border uh, is uh, imminently the border now. Uh, even though we're starting to get to these flows now, we're starting to, to see how the river's behaving. So take a step back in South Australia, because we don't really have any major tributaries into the river, we tend to refer to all our floods as what the flow is at the border, and then um, then we can give you a specific advice of water levels relative to that flow at every town along the river. We have tables of, of those water levels uh, in the information um, available. And we also have the flood maps for the same range of flows. So for context, the 1974 flood was 182 gigalitres per day at the border. 75, 1975 was about 162. Um, 1956 was way bigger at 341 gigalitres per day. Our current advice is that we're going to get between 170 and 180 at the border in early December, which is kind of just around that 1974 level. Uh, and then later in December, it'll be larger than that, uh, probably above one, almost probably above 185 gigalitres per day, maybe 200, small chance of 220. So. If it got to 200 gigalitres per day, then that would be bigger than the 74 and 75 flood by a bit, and the 220 would be bigger than the 1931 flood, which was 210. Um, so we're just waiting for um, the, 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 the peak for that second event, that's the second actual peak, the larger one, that will reach the border in December. It's still in a part of the river where it's very hard to measure what the flow is. It's also spread out across the floodplain. So uh, we, we, we've... We're feeling fairly confident in that range, but we won't have better advice what that actual peak will be later until it gets a bit closer and moves past some of those uh, spread out parts of the river. You may be aware that on Friday there's a lot of uh, social media things about um, the levels in uh, Renmark already exceeding the 1974 level, uh, even though apparently the flow at the border was only 150 odd gigalitres per day. Um, and you know, you would expect that. Um, 170, uh, 1974 would be higher up at, at, at those levels would occur at a higher flow. We expected that. However, 
we also could, was aware that this is the biggest flow, only flow we've had of this size in 47 years, so nearly 50 years. And we know that a lot of changes have occurred to the river and those uh, water levels that we've provided as advice and the flood maps uh, and also we've also provided some historical flood levels in the information we have available on sa.gov.au. All those events, all those levels and extents are all been observed or calibrated to events that are nearly 50 years old or older and we know that the river's probably changed in that time but that's just the best information we have. And now the, ri the river is uh, starting to get up to those high levels at the border, we're starting to see that some information is more reliable than others. Um, the, the levels at Renmark are a bit higher than we thought they would have been, not by much, but they are a bit, and that could be due to things like, you know, maybe the channel is not as deep, or maybe there's more vegetation on the floodplain. We're also thinking, well, maybe the flow measurement at the border is not that great. And we have seen uh, in some other locations further upstream that uh, some flow measurement doesn't perform very well at very high flows because the water is so spread out on the floodplain, it's just so hard to measure, it could be going all over the place. Other areas, the, the quality is going to be quite good. So the Department for Environment and Water, we are quite busy at the moment um, going out and checking uh, water level gauges, flow gauges, and just getting a better understanding of what information is reliable, and also getting a better understanding of how this actual flood is travelling down the border. And so um, now that we've sort of moved from the, the forecast of the weeks away and now we're actually starting to get those peaks coming down, we will update our information on the website with some, um, I guess, more fine-tuned uh, predictions of what those water levels will be. But of course, it's only ever, I guess, the best information that we have. Um, I would still um, expect a margin of error because we can't predict every, every aspect of, of a river. Um, lots of things could have happened um, uh, physically, um, on, on the, in the channel or the floodplain that we could just never quite predict from outside. So there are a guide, um, those uh, to tables of water levels, but you know, they'll, they'll have like the normal pool level and plus the predicted level, so you go, oh look, it's going to rise five metres, and then also the, the flood maps will show an extent, expect, expected extent of inundation um, to show you what it's probably likely to go, but again, they're not, they're not perfect, they're a guide only. So, all that information is available on the sa.gov.au website. The Department for Environment and Water also produces a weekly flow report. It comes out on a Friday. And we put lots of information in that about uh, what, the, uh, what the flow is likely to do and levels and just other bits to help with the interpretation of that information. Um, uh, also, I mentioned that upstream we're seeing these levels are just uh, hovering for a long time. They're quite stable. and. We do expect that this flow event is going to persist um, up this upper end of the river until quite high, these kind of levels to well into, into January and, in, and probably still above 100 gig a day into, into February. So these water levels as we're seeing now, and, and um, they're going to be around for quite a while, so um, just to be prepared for that. And uh, we will see persistent flows coming down um, even after that from the Darling, the Murrumbidgee rivers, but so we'll have elevated flows for a while. but. It is really high levels will be around for another month or two. And finally, just um, touch on the black water. I'm not sure you're aware, black water events, or hypoxic black water, hypoxic meaning low oxygen, occurs commonly after floods when uh, flood waters wash the uh, leaf litter and organic matter into the river and all the little microorganisms uh, munch it up and in doing so consume the oxygen and then that leaves nothing for fish to breathe and the, often the water smells terrible and nasty black colour. And, uh, and there's often you'll see fish kills, and that has happened um, upstream uh, a month or so ago. There were places in on the border between New South Wales and Victoria where, like, there was there was zero oxygen in the water. Um, we are preparing for that to possibly occur in South Australia as those floodwaters come down. We did have some blackwater events in previous floods in 2016 and 2011. We haven't quite cr crossed the threshold for that yet. However, there is low dissolved oxygen in the river. Um, normally in the sort of range of 7 to 11 milligrams per litre of oxygen. We have seen a number of uh, readings between 2 and 4, which stresses fish and particularly those large body native fish like Murray cod. There has been a handful of uh, uh, cod fish depths up near the border. There's not a great deal we can do. It is a natural process, but there are some negative impacts. Some SA water speak on that as well. Um, uh, but um, it, it, it is quite, uh, it can be quite smelly and unsightly, um, but to date we haven't actually reached that um, hypoxic blackwater event at the moment.
That's all I'm going to talk about today, and I'm happy to chat later. Thanks, Chrissy. Next up, we have David Beaton, who's the CEO for the Loxton Wakery Council. Thank you. Um, so, is everyone here to talk about Loxton? I don't need to divert into other areas, or there some other areas you want to know about as well? All right. So, I'll I'll talk about Loxton. So, the the main areas have been of concern have been uh, the caravan park, and obviously the lower level went out. Uh, quite early, and now with the um, continued rise of the waters, um, there's further areas in the caravan park that um, potentially can be be affected. The caravan park was built, excuse me, <coughs> was built to the 74, 75 levels, and if we're going to go past 74, 75, we're going to have a few issues. The the new glamping tents that we put in a um, year or so ago. Um, we're right, we've got some stilts and they'll rise up by a metre and three of the four have been done and the other one will be completed tomorrow. Um, we're getting um, defence cells, so they're about a metre and a half high um, and a couple hundred metres of that to go around the other infrastructure that we've got at the caravan park. So that'll protect that well um, and SES are coming to do that next week. Um, and the advantage of that is that later on when we don't need it, it's, it's easier to take down as well. The other area of concern is the Loxton Historical Village. So we're extending the uh, levee bank that we've got there, so it's extending out to the men's shed on the western side and on the eastern side, just a small area, to the toilet. So we've been starting that today. Um, and possibly should have that finished tomorrow. One of the other concerns within that area is um, if we get seepage start to come up, so we'll um, have we've got three pumps that we've purchased, so if they start to get a problem with, with seepage that we can actually pump the water out and over top of the levee bank just to look after all the buildings because most of them are irreplaceable. Um, so it's not necessarily something that can be fixed by insurance because they've been they're old buildings that have been moved there. Um, other things that we've been doing is trying to take uh, levels in Maruk and Kingston on Murray just to give people advice as to where their um, residents or buildings sit uh, with the, the levels that are predicted for the, for the water flows so they can make the best preparations if they know whether their property is going to potentially be inundated. And at the levels that are, are predicted Marooks certainly safe. Kingston Murray, where we've lifted the uh, levee bank, is going to be fine. Um, and additionally, if the Kingston Road goes out, we've got a diversion there that goes up Drogamulla Road and Heinrich Road. So that'll um, take it up and around the town and comes out near the Kingston Murray um, winery. So there's even if that goes out and there's another road that we can't necessarily use, there's another diversion that we um, can put in place to make sure people can get out and around through the Riverland as well. And that's about all. Thanks very much, David. Next, I would like to invite Tony, Tony Scaladup from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Thank you. So I'm Tony Scarlett, I'm from the Department for Infrastructure and Transport and I'm based out at Murray Bridge. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you about some um, uh, the um, impacts to ferries, marine safety and roads. Um, we do have a flyer on the table back there um, with all the websites and phone numbers and everything that are relevant to those um, particular issues, um, which you can take and take for friends and family as well. Um, so. You will have already known that book, we closed Book Penong Road last week um, when we could no longer keep it open because the water was coming up over the road. Um, we did try to keep it open as long as possible um, because we know how big an impact that has to this region. Um, so, um, so that one's closed. You have very friendly flies here. Um, now, the only other road in this area that we've closed so far is Morgan Road, and that's to support the Berry Barmer Council works that they're doing up there for Lake Bonnie. Um, any other roads we're monitoring, um, like David said, the um, um, Kingston Road is one of the other roads that's at risk, so we're monitoring that all the time. Um, and we'll notify um, 
everybody by social media and our website um, and press releases with any closures that we're expecting. We try to give as much notice as possible when that happens. Um, we, we've got detours um, planned already for any of the roads that we've identified and they're up on our website so you can check um, for the detours that we've planned so that you can already you know, figure out how long it's going to take you if you need to use those detours. Um, any current road closures are already listed on Traffic SA website and so you can check for those but that's only once they're in place. Um, we already said that it's never safe to drive into floodwaters um, so if you I come across any floodwaters on the roads please call the Traffic Management Centre on 1800 018 313 and they're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, also with ferries, as um, Brad said before, the Lyric Ferry closed um, last week um, and Morgan and Swan Reach ferries are closing tonight at seven o'clock, so they've just closed three minutes ago. Um, so we've got a few other ferries that we're expecting might close in the next week. Um, and we will uh, let people know via social media on our website and we've got a dedicated web page for ferry um, operational statuses that we keep up to date and including when we're expecting things to close. So if we know a closure date and time, we'll put that on there. Um, many of you might have seen the um, River Murray um, vessel restrictions that we've put in place a couple of weeks ago um, about the four knot speed limit. And basically that's for vessels not to travel within 250 metres of any submerged buildings or um, dwellings and levee banks. Um, so that's, yeah, so four knot speed limit around those things. Um, and also at night and in restricted visibility. Um, jet skis can't go um, faster than four knots at any po point of the river. Um, also there's restrictions around locks and weirs um, with no swimming, bathing and diving within 50, 250 metres, um, as well as human-powered toys and uh, aquatic tools, such as rowboats, surf skis, kayaks, that sort of thing. And any vessels 12 metres and under must have all passengers wearing uh, life, boat, life jackets um, while underway or at anchor. Um, and all those restrictions go all the way from the border right down to the ferry landings at Wellington. Um, so our marine team, as Brad said, everyone needs to take extra care on the river and on the shore of the river um, at this time because those waters can be treacherous at the moment with the flows and the debris that's in there, as well as the fact that there's a lot of submerged uh, hazards um, that you might not see. That, um, we're trying to mark them all out with yellow buoys and signage. Um, but if you know of a hazard that hasn't been marked, you can report it to us by Googling marine safety um, and it's the first link that comes up in the search term. Um, there's a report form on there where you can report any um, submerged things, um, hazards in the water that haven't been um, marked yet. We've got marine team up in the area. They're here constantly at the moment and marking off all those hazards. There's also a 50 metre exclusion zone around power lines at the moment. We're just advising people to stay out of the floodplains as much as possible and certainly you can't go within 50 metres of any of the submerged power line uh, or infrastructures. Um, and so in summary, I would su um, suggest uh, keeping in mind that if you've got hazards on the road, call the Traffic Management Centre. If there's hazards in the water, report them through our form on marine safety um, and take care of each other. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And it's um, really interesting to hear both Brad and Tony saying about those um, the river flows. Just be very, very careful. And the, river, the the flow is incredibly deceptive, and probably moving much faster than anyone would um, imagine. So thank you. And next up, we have Barb Cowie, who's with Primary Industries SA. Hi. Uh, most of you in the room would know uh, who I am. I work for Primary Industries, but in the regions section, so don't just deal with Primary Industries per se, but more regional development and community-based work as well. And I did have to check my phone to make sure I had the right free flow information up here because we do have the expert in the room. Uh, and I didn't want to make a mistake. 
No. So um, obviously, uh, primary industries will be, has got our normal activities that we are continuing on with, um, and fruit fly is one of them. We currently have 16 outbreaks, with one that has been extended yesterday. Um, and that is the Remark West one, and uh, it's, there's a slight alteration to the zone and um, hoping for a fingers crossed end date early February. Um, with that in mind, we uh, did have most of the fruit fly operations based here in Loxton, but with road closures and um, access, the, the majority of the team has actually been moved to the um, field day site. So we have a significant amount of people working out of there. Having said that, what has also happened with the SES requiring a whole lot of people to door knock, we've also activated some of our orange army into door knocking. If someone with a Persa orange jumpsuit does knock on your door, the chances are they are part of the SES door knocking team, but they will have ID on them if you're not um, sure. So please, if you feel at all uh, worried, ask for their ID. Um, having said that, we also have our other normal work and um, I, I just want to uh, mention that we also continually monitor Varroa we're uh, doing the foot and mouth and we're encouraging everybody to look at Japanese encephalitis and uh, if you live on the river corridor, especially as waters start to recede, you are eligible for a vaccination, so please go and get it. Um, on to flood, which is what we're here for. Um, look, we're part of the entire state emergency response. We, uh, we have people that are talking to everybody's people every day. We also have a um, PERSA flood uh, coordination group that are meeting twice a week now. Our primary concern is obviously primary industries, the industries related to that. Um, and we, uh, in the first instance, we did what just about every other agency did, which was get um, some DEW numbers. We did some inundation mapping and we sort of identified what, what were our areas of significance. And when we did that, the majority of the land that we thought was going to be vulnerable was uh, pasture. Uh, we did have some, um, obviously, dairies down in the bottom end. There were a few vines and a few trees, but the majority was um, annual cropping. So um, having said that, um, as Chrissy explained, there's a few changes. And so what we've also now, or we're in the process of doing, is having the inundation map overlaid with actual um, markers so that we're actually going to a 56 marker point um, over the inundation of a 250 model. So we will have two lines that we'll be looking at and assessing how that, that works. Part of what I do is go and ground truth. So if uh, we think that we don't know what's on the ground, I will drive there and I will check, take a photo, send it back in and we add it to our, our mapping. So believe me, there's a lot of work going into, into our maps. Um, if there is inundation, we are the lead agency for animals. Um, and so what would happen is there'd be a phone call into our um, hotline or our, our emergency number or the SES. Uh, that will be triaged to us and we will then uh, work out who's the best person to go out there. We deal with the RSPCA a lot. So they may be called if it's just a simple removal. Um, if it's an animal welfare issue, then you'll have our um, animal health officers come and visit. Please, if you see any animals in distress, make sure you report them. Um, we also have um, uh, crops coming off and right now we're in one of the best grain seasons that we've had um, for a long time. We have a lot more trucks on the road and we have roads that are closed. And the ma majority of those trucks, as most people in this room would know, are heading to a little place just out of Loxton. And so please be patient on the road. Um, there is a lot. and. Um, we just we do just ask that people be a bit patient. They, it, this is their livelihood. They have a small window of opportunity, and it's really important to get this off. Um, on top of that, uh, we have our farm and business mentors, which are there for anybody to have a chat to. See, they they are very aware of all the agencies and services that are that are around, and we have three in our region: being Brent Fletcher, um, Robin Kane, and John Chase. Their numbers are easily found on the website or um, like as, as well, I'm happy to provide a number or someone can give me a call. 
Uh, we're also part of the Relief Centre, so we have uh, someone sitting in the Berry office um, two days a week at the moment. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but right now we're only taking expressions of interest. We don't have our grant guidelines out totally, and unfortunately we do need that person also at Loxton because of all the activity going on with the fruit fly outbreak. So our resources are really stretched and we're trying to do the best that we can, considering we also have a relief centre that we'll be manning in Manham in a, in a week or so. So things from a person perspective is, is very tight. Um, as I said, the expression of interest for primary industry grants is out. Um, we're hoping to get some guidelines out by the end of the week. Um, and also with that expression of interest, if there's any growers that are in the uh, looking at the generator grants, we ask that you put that in those expressions of interest as well. We um, and we'll make sure that they get to the right person. Um, oh, Chrissy mentioned Blackwater. They're really lucky they deal with the water. We're really lucky we, can, we deal with the fish that might die. Um, and we have in place a whole lot of uh, processes and um, people ready to be activated if there is any major fish kills. Unfortunately, we're pretty confident that will happen at some stage and we, we really need to ask the community to be our eyes in that because we can't see all of the areas that, that this will happen and traditionally it will be the shallower disconnected spaces that will probably get a fish kill first but we are ready to clean up and the more we know even about small scale kills uh, the more we can um, map what's going on and also be ready for any of those bigger events. Um, today we learned that there's been some minor ones around Lake Bonnie for ex ex instance so they can be reported to the a fish watch number or the the fish app. Um, just as a word of um, not it, it's just a bit of a, an FYI um, for irrigators we know that there's going to be more organics uh, we know filters are becoming a bit of an issue so we know that also uh, watering at night might be a little bit more problematic if there is extra filters to be cleaned. Um, and we know that from an irrigation perspective, uh, the spreading of irrigation is, is nicer for water access. Um, and so we're just once again um, asking people to be mindful that there's a lot, of, lot going on, a lot of people trying to do a lot of things and um, resolve a lot of, a lot of lot of issues but we are also mindful that irrigators will actually have more organics come through with more filter cleans as well. Um, on something totally different as part of my normal role in primary industries, if there are a group of uh, people in that primary industry space um, and they are struggling to work out where to go for information or how to get the right people to sit around a table and have a conversation, I'm happy to have a chat and see whether we can organise uh, the, the groups to actually get to the right people. So if there's any um, sort of self, if, there's, if there are any groups, and there are a lot of really, really good conversations that are had out there in the community, um, I'm happy to come and try and work out who might be best to give the, answer the questions that they have. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Barb. Very much appreciated. Next up, we have Housing SA. We've got Kelly Lambert. Thank you very much. Yes, as um, I was introduced, I'm Kelly Lambert from SA Housing Authority. Um, we are a lead agency for relief in a disaster. So when the lead ag agency activates us, we um, get ready and set up relief centres, which we have done in Barrie, and we invite um, participating agencies to come in to be there as well. So that's your one-stop shop for emotional, um, physical and financial assistance. Um, it is open in Berry at the moment, nine to five, seven days a week, and tomorrow opens in Manham as well. Um, I encourage you to get down there. Um, financially, um, there are grants available in there. There's um, various grants which are listed on the sa.gov.au site and the eligibility, basic eligibility is listed there as well. Um, you can call the relief number to see if you're eligible or just pop into one of the centres and talk to people to see if you're eligible. There is, you know, basic personal hardship grants for people that have to um, 
are displaced from their home and impacted by the flood and they can't live there. Um, there's also rental assistance grants um, and there's accommodation grants as well. Um, the generator grant is run out of there as well through um, DIIS um, and small business as well. So Centrelink are also there to provide anyone any assistance for those that can't get to their workplace um, due to um, flooding events. Um, and so I just suggest you go down there. But it's also there for psychosocial support. So really feel free to come in, have a cup of tea. Um, Red Cross are there for that and Disaster Ministries as well. Um, that's a place for you to go to, you know, if you're not impacted by the flood but you just want to talk to someone because you can see what's happening around your community and your neighbours, that's a place to go for that as well. So I really encourage you. It's all about the people for the people there. So um, please get down there and support that. Hot off the press and not on the sagov.au site just yet but announced by the Premier today is um, our team are madly trying to book as many beds along the river as we can so that if people can't find alternative accommodation and they're impacted, um, we may be able to put them up in a motel to try and keep them in the local area. Um, this will be for a short term um, and I really must stress that there's not much accommodation around here, as you guys probably know, so it is a last resort um, and it won't be able to take people's belongings as, as much. It would just be a place to sleep and to keep dry, um, but it is something my team are trying to madly source at the moment along the river, just to keep people in their community, which is the best thing to do in, a, in this sort of scenario. Um, yeah, so that should be up on the SA Gov site soon, but you can go into the Berry Relief Centre or Manum tomorrow and talk about that because we're all ready to go with it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, next up, we have Paul Irwin for, from SA Power Networks. Thank you. We've been uh, monitoring the flood, obviously, like everybody else, and working with all other agencies as the, the event starts to unfold. Unfortunately, there's a number of disconnections of power that have taken place already and will continue to take place as, as water level rises. Um, but we're doing our best to minimise those as much as we possibly can, to the point now that the disconnections that have taken place so far have all been individual disconnections, so we've been able to access and go to a specific property and just cut that specific property off without uh, affecting other people. Um, hopefully we can continue to do that, but if floodwaters rise faster than we can get there, we'll eventually have to cut off larger larger areas. Very much it's those areas that are risk of in risk of flooding. So when I'm talking about cutting people off or disconnection of power, it's really if you're being inundated with water, or if the infrastructure that serves you has a gap that's far too low between the water line and the, and the power lines. The power lines that you see in the street out here are at a specific height for a reason, and that's to avoid electric shock. And when you start reducing that height level with increasing water levels, the chance of shock becomes a significant increase. The good news uh, about this is the, the government, as you heard from, from DIT, have announced the 50 metre exclusion zone around um, power infrastructure. In turn, that's triggered the Office of the Technical Regulator to review what is a safe distance between power lines and water. So they've reduced the need uh, in that space about what is a safe distance, which means that we don't disconnect, we don't need to disconnect as many people as we would have had to have under the old model. People will still be safe if they adhere to that 50 metre exclusion zone around any power infrastructure. Um, important for us to say that recovery and restoration is likely to be quite challenging for us as a business. When it comes into restoring your supply, we've obviously gone out under blue skies to disconnect, roads have been clear, you can drive straight to the property and do what you need to do. Obviously when floodwaters recede you've got to wait for roads and areas to dry out because they could be quite boggy. You might be faced with roads that have just been completely washed away or have so much debris over them you can't make your way through. We just ask for your patience during, during that time. Um, we will try and provide as much notice where we can if you are um, a property we're looking at to disconnect. 
At the back of the room is this flyer on the table. Um, I'd ask if you could pick one of those up. If you're familiar how to use QR codes, there's an SMS service that we look to communicate with people through. If you're not familiar with QR codes, then just call us on the number at the bottom of that sheet, 13 12 61, and we'll just take you through the process. If you already get information from us whenever there's a storm and your power goes out, if you're already getting an SMS from us, you're already signed up to that service. So we know who you are, we know where you live, we've got your number and we can communicate with you. Um, importantly, I'd ask you if you know that there's people that aren't here in the room tonight, neighbours, friends, businesses that aren't here that would benefit from hearing from us if they're in danger of being disconnected, we'd ask you to reach out to them and speak to them about signing up for that, for that service. Um, when we do look to communicate with you, um, it's not a definite that your power is going to go off. We've only got two dimensional maps that we've, we've had for years and years. It's only when our crews get on our site and can make an assessment on site to say you're either going to be impacted or actually you're not going to be impacted because we can look at the topography of the land. So that's happened at the moment where all of the uh, people that we've contacted, not necessarily everybody's gone off. When you do, if you do get disconnected, uh, we'll let your retailer know that you've been disconnected so they don't end up trying to send you a, an estimated bill for a time you just haven't been at the, at the property. That's not appropriate. Um, we'll also let them know when your powers come back on and we'll take you through what you need to do at that time. If you are a business or you know of businesses um, that have electrical infrastructure that is going to be impacted um, and they need to raise pumps, switchboards to do whatever, um, we ask you to contact us immediately. We've got a lot of people on the ground in the area to expedite those alterations and help lift your infrastructure out of the water to hopefully uh, keep people keep people going. Um, it's it's definitely something that we want to try and minimise the impact on. We're quite you know, sensitive about the fact that, you know, we don't want to disrupt the economic prosperity of the, the community and the area. Um, we want to do that to the least extent we can, but there will at sometimes be disconnections. We know there's a lot of people whose livelihoods depend on those businesses keeping going in this area as well. So it's very much front of mind for our business. Um, in the... Um, the um, SMS service that I've been talking about, we don't actually publicise and we haven't publicised where we're going to disconnect properties and people. We've done that for a reason uh, because we're aware in the eastern states that have flooded there's been looting uh, occurring up and down the river through those places so we don't want to put a blueprint out for people that want to act in an unscrupulous behaviour. We'd, we'd rather have that one-on-one -on -one direct relationship with you. We do share the information about properties we've disconnected with the essential services that are there to support you, like um, the SES, your council, etc. cetera. Um, but we don't want to make that public to everybody. Um, so I really encourage you to sign up for the, for the SMS service. If your property is going to be flooded or you think it will be flooded, we ask you to make it electrically safe now. Um, switch off and unplug any appliances, put them high. You probably already know that anyway, but we ask you to turn off your main electrical switch at the switchboard. Um, also, if you've got solar panels, we ask you to turn them off. If you're not sure how to do that, just call us on that 13 12 61 number on the flyer at the back and we'll take you through the process for that. You may find that they will be damaged if you don't go through that process. You paid a lot of money for these things. You want them to be working when the floodwaters recede, so it's best to, to protect them if you can. If you've got a battery, we'd ask you to remove it because lithium, lithium ion batteries, if they're submerged in water, have been known to explode. So we'd ask you to remove that if you've got one of those. If the water reaches any of your general power outlets, so the your power outlets by the bottom of your skirting boards or outside power outlets, good idea to have that checked by an electrician before you move back into the property. If the water level reaches your switchboard outside where your meters are, um, you'll need to get an electrician to come in and fill out a certificate of compliance that says it's okay for you to move back in. This is for your safety uh, that you'd need to have this done. If you do get back into your home and it was in inundated and you're back in there and you start using your, your house again, if you feel any tingling sensation in your taps, this is your shower taps, your bathroom, your kitchen, you need to contact us immediately. That's saying that there's a problem in your property. We'll come out and assess that for you. If we can fix it, we'll do it for you. 
if you need to get an electrician in to fix it for you, we'll advise you of that there. But that's an important one that, that you need to keep in the back of your mind. Um, we ask you just adhere to, and I know everybody here will adhere to that, that rule of um, staying 50 metres clear of um, power infrastructure. That's important. You should never expect that any of it is, is dead, that it's actually alive. Um, and I'd always treat it as being live. You live in this area, you've seen on the floodplains, there's plenty of poles and wires travelling through those and quite a number of those are still live. Um, what can you do uh, from here? Most importantly, sign up for the SMS service. I have two of my fellow workmates here, uh, Kim and Brenton. If you'd like any more information about your specific property, if you're worried about your specific property and will it be inundated, um, perhaps seek us after this meeting. We'll be able to show you on those maps what that will potentially look like at the flood levels that have been predicted. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Paul. And. Our final speaker is Joshua from SA Water. Thank you, Di. <clears throat> I'm going to be fairly quick, um, but happy to talk with anyone afterwards if you've got more specific questions. And again, for our viewers online, lots of information at sawater.com.au. But to put it simply, um, particularly in this area, thinking about drinking water, um, supply and quality, um, just to reinforce really clearly and firmly at the moment, there are currently no impacts to drinking water quality or supply for any of SA Water's customers, and that's actually along the whole length of the river. But it is important for you to know that there is the potential that that could change as the peak occurs, if there is any damage to infrastructure at the water treatment plants. Now that's unlikely or of a low likelihood because they are at levels where um, they're hopefully out of reach, but we've also done a lot of preparation around raising um, some essential infrastructure there and putting some extra protection in place as well. Uh, the other aspect there is quality and that goes back to, um, Chrissy was touching on black water before, um, the, most of you are probably familiar with that term. Again, just to be explicitly clear, there is currently no black water in any South Australian sections of the river. But what that means for drinking water quality is that it just makes that raw water from the river um, more challenging for the treatment plants to process. Now, they're designed to cope with that, uh, but as that quality deteriorates further, that task will just become more challenging and they might not, or well, they might come a situation where they might not be able to fully remove all of the taste and odour compounds that are associated with the organic material in the water. The water that we will supply through the drinking water network will still be safe and clean, uh, but it might have a slightly earthy or musty taste or um, odour to it, smell. Um, but within the room, for example, two of us might actually be able to detect that and the rest of us might not. It really varies between people. So practically speaking, the things that I would really love for everyone to do is to think about uh, drinking water in their preparation in the same way that you'd think about um, torches, batteries, clothes, food, etc. Um, so put aside, I would recommend at least 20 litres of drinking water per person in the property. Uh, pop that in the pantry. I would also encourage you to think about carrying a supply like that in a car as well in case you cannot get home at some point. And that's just to tide you over for a couple of days if we do have some kind of issue with one of the treatment plants um, until we get some kind of alternate arrangement in place or provide other advice. The other practical thing that I would like you to do is also uh, sign up for SMS uh, service interruption notifications from SA Water as well. So the bottom line is that if uh, something does eventuate and there is an interruption to your drinking water supply, we will be very proactively trying to tell you about it, to tell you what's happened, what we're doing, and what we might need you to actually do in response as well. So the best way that you can hear about that if it's affecting you is through the SMS notification. And you can do that just by visiting sawater.com.au um, or you can call us on 1300 SA Water and a human in Adelaide will take your details as well. Um, the other thing is just to uh, follow us on Facebook because we put a lot of information out through there. We'll also let you know through traditional media as well. So um, ABC uh, predominantly is the first port of call for that emergency information. Thank you. 
Thank you. So that brings the information session to an end and thank you to all our speakers for providing all that information and hopefully a lot of your questions have been answered. We'll now open the floor for questions. Um, Michael will move around with the mic if you'd like to put your hand up. Swap them in a minute. Um, and if I can ask you to please use the microphone when you ask a question because we've got people live streaming and I'll also check if there's any questions being posted on our live stream as well. So please, any questions that you have, um, we've got a fantastic range of speakers, please feel free to ask some. Uh, Trevor Norton, Mayor of Loxton Wakery. Uh, a couple of quick things, I've been to a few of these sessions and uh, tonight the opportunity presents itself while I've got you all here. Firstly, the Relief Centre in Berry. We've just heard tonight that the road from here to Berry is no longer able to get there, which means you've got about an hour journey whichever way you go. Any thought to running a day or two over here in the Loxton Research Centre with your people? Because I heard you talk about how important it is to be able to sit down with people and do so. I would suggest that you may consider running some of those sessions away from Barry where people can actually get to you. So that's, that's the first thing I'd like to raise with you. Secondly, and it's a rather large issue, and uh, Alex, you might want to take some notes around this. Um, I've, I've heard tonight about everyone, every agency we talked about did, said that, you know, debris in the water and you're tagging it up with yellow things and SES are out and about telling everyone where they, they could be flooded, etc. But I haven't heard at any of these sessions anyone talking about debris on low-lying floodland being left and going into the river. And uh, I dare say, as a local government, we don't have any levers to pull other than if it's a fire hazard or a vermin hazard. But I would have thought since a state of emergency was declared by Grant Stevens on the 22nd of November, that perhaps SES, when they drive past these places and see all this low-lying rubbish on River Flat, might have stopped and issued a notice to the people that have got the rubbish there because it's all going to end up in the river. And you talk about debris, try 14 kilometres an hour under the Kingston Bridge with a gas bottle or a, an old washing machine shooting down the river. Has anyone thought about doing anything about that? Because I'm sure you've all seen it in your travels. Because I had SES knock on my door on the 30th at Holmes Road. And if you go about a half a K up the road from me, there is literally rubbish line everywhere. And no one's done anything about it. OK. We'll, um, we, we might just do the relief centre first. Is there any thoughts on that? Or is that just something that we will take on notice? Yep. So we'll take that on notice. Um, but Barb's going to respond to some of the debris and watch it. It's like you read our minds, Trev. Um, it was only... <laughs> yeah, look, um, I, no, and um, yesterday uh, I actually sent some photos through to Adelaide uh, where there was uh, some debris that, well, it was actually um, farm uh, chemical containers and obviously they were uh, having a little bit of water around them and that is a hazard. Um, with the emergency declaration, uh, Green Industries and EPA are both involved at different levels. Uh, there has now been a decision to, and Green Industries have wanted to get involved earlier, um, but with now the debris that will happen sooner rather than later. So. There, that has been talked about, and I know that at one of the other council meetings um, downstream, there was also the discussion about having transfer stations opened just a little bit longer, so people who do live on river or near river uh, floodways that are going to be um, inundated, that they could actually get to the transfer station. I don't know that that's an issue here so much as down river, but that was also. I, I don't think that's the answer, Bob. We, we're happy to uh, facilitate that. There's literally stuff all over the place and your guys would have seen any amount of it on Holmes Road when they're making their way down to my place to give me a note under the door. But nothing's happened. I can, I can guarantee you Giza, of Green yep. Industries SA, are aware yep. of it and are um, coming on board. I, I get that, but SES are the head, head organisation here coordinating the whole thing, yet don't seem to have done anything about it. 
uh, we continue to work with them. Um, yeah, we continue to work with all our agencies per the EPA and try and understand all of those risks and understand the activities that we can undertake to try and mitigate those impacts from having those debris and, and those sorts of things out, um, out on the floodplains that can be washed um, into the river and obviously cause all sorts of problems um, downstream and in, our local, in local areas. Um, and we're going to continue to work on that. And I'm happy to talk to you offline as well. So in terms of action that's being taken today, we continue to understand what those risks are and understand what it is, and we continue to work. Thank you. Part of the response is also safe work um, SA need to be involved for some of it as well. So there is a, a multi-agency. Look, I know that's not answering, but I do. Know, I can guarantee you, Trevor, that it is now um, higher on the radar than what it was 24 hours ago. The question I got asked today, well, the question I got asked today, if something gets in the river, where does it stop? And I thought, how can I tell you where it stops? So, yeah. Um, thank you. Well, Alex has certainly got it on notice, and so have um, the other agencies. Do we have any other questions? No? Um, I will just check with Samuel. Was there anything online? Yeah, um, for David, there was just a comment online when you said most people hear from Loxton. So someone said, I want to hear about Marook. So it's just someone online. So whether you want to address that or just a minute. Here we go. Yeah, I, I did. I, I did try and address a bit about my room before when I said we were going along and checking all the levels of the of the levee banks and the, the uh, taking the uh, levels for some of the uh, private people as well. Uh, Near the levee banks to make sure that they they're not going to be inundated, um, and taking the levels along the road and the levee bank that goes around the town and looking at the diversion as well. So it's certainly been in front of mind. It hasn't had a lot of work done because, as the predictions currently are, it doesn't need a lot of work. Um, with the potential for the the roads to chop off, is going to be the bigger problem for the, the, the traffic getting through there. Then how's it going? The the other thing is that a lot of the agencies have said about go and see this website, go and see that website. The council libraries are open seven days a week, so if you've got people and, and uh, they want to know what's going on, they can go into the library. People from the library will give them a hand to get on online to those websites and make sure that they can get the information that they want. And because those websites are updated. They want to do that every couple of days because things change and we get uh, predictions for potentially higher flows, then that information can be updated and people that aren't necessarily online all the time can have access to that information as well. Do we have any other questions? Comments? Well, in that case, is there any um, other any other bits of information you'd like to share from our speakers? No? Thank you. Um, that will bring our meeting to a close. Thank you to everybody who, to, to our speakers um, initially, and also to the venue and to those who have helped setting us up. But also a huge thank you to, to you people for coming out tonight. Um, we will continue to work together and we will continue to keep you updated as much as we can. Um, I did want to just reiterate too that the, the safety of our community members is the number one priority for all of us and we would also appreciate, we, it would be wonderful to consider your own personal safety as well as a number one priority and look after your, um, your health and your safety and your well-being 
Um, again, please look at the posters and the brochures down the back. Feel free to take any for yourselves and for anybody else that may not be able to make it tonight. And thank you also to people on live stream. Our speakers have offered to stay for a little while while we pack up, so please feel free to come and follow up any questions that you have. Thanks very much.